I want to introduce Paul Bowden and Jeff Calvis from Microsoft. They're going to share all about managing Microsoft 2019. Um, so yeah, we'll just turn it over, let them have the stage. Jeff, Paul. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, just a real honor uh, to be here. Um, before we get started, I just want to give a, a huge shout out to everybody on the uh, Microsoft Office channel in Mac Admin Slack. Uh, you guys yes. are just amazing and the best. Uh, we've uh, probably belonged to the channel now, both of us, for I guess coming up for three years. And uh, we live our lives day by day looking at the channel, seeing what's being reported, and that prioritizes our day. It's one thing to you know stand on stage and say, yeah, we listen to your feedback. But man, I hope we really do listen to your feedback. And uh, you give us some, some just uh, great ideas for what we need to uh, improve and change in the future. OK, so this is, uh, should be a, a packed presentation. Um, first off, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the why of uh, the different versions of Office 2016, 2019, 365, and uh, give you an, an idea as to how we build it and the kind of the decisions that we make uh, when building. And then uh, all the sexy stuff is going to come along when Jeff starts talking. Wow. And that's, uh, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff and his team have been doing some amazing changes uh, to the management of uh, Outlook. And uh, he has a whole horde of new uh, CF preferences to show you for uh, improving the way that Outlook launches and how it's displayed. OK, so um, I'm going to try and not take too much time here. But uh, let's, let's give you like a, a little bit of background. Um, we think of Office in terms of generations. And um, you know, many years ago, <laughs> it seems many years ago now, many late nights, of course, we had Office 2011 for Mac. And we had this minimum of, of Leopard uh, for our release. And uh, the end of life, well, that was last year, um, almost kind of to the year, 2017. And I really hope that nobody has 2011 left in their environment. And uh, there are a couple of people like okay. hiding looking, down there. Looking. But 2011 is gone. Um, we spent a, a long time in the dark, uh, not aimlessly in the dark, but we were building Office for iPad uh, for several years. And then we came out with uh, Office 2016 for Mac. And, uh, and that was in, in the year 2015. So end of life for 2016 for Mac. And when I say end of life, I mean you know, to the point that you can still get support um, is uh, October 2020. Now, and that was our minimum OS of 10.10 .10 Yosemite. Now, very recently, and this is uh, really within the last month, uh, we've released the Office 2019 generation of client. And a couple of things have changed. And I want to explain to you why those things have changed. Office 2019 for Mac does not have a fixed minimum OS. Instead, we are taking a hard stance of n minus 2. Um, I gave a shout out to Mac admins because uh, a couple of months ago, I uh, would have been standing up here and said, oh, well, it's n minus 1. And uh, when I posted that to the channel, there was a huge uproar. And we heard your feedback loud and clear that n minus 1 wasn't going to cut it. And hence the reason why it says n minus 2 here. So uh, and it's thanks to you. <clears throat> you know, one of the greatest things about Mac admins is uh, I can post something at like 9 AM in the morning. By 10 AM, I have like 36 pieces of feedback. And on the N minus 2, I actually printed them out. I actually wasted paper, but I think for a good reason. And I slammed them on my boss's desk. And I said, N minus 1 is not what people want. And true story. <laughs> uh, so N minus 2. Um, and then the end of life is 2023. Let me, let me kind of drill into this N minus 2 a little bit more, because kind of a, a, a bit of a gotcha in there. Oh, first, I should say that. Um, even though we think of developing the client in terms of generations, there's always this question of like, oh, what, what about Office 365? What generation is that? Well, 365 is a, is a skew or as a license. And 365 kind of transcends all the generations. So I could be Office 365 activated, but I may be on a 2016 generation client or a 2019 generation client. 
So that's really the, kind of the difference between you know, when we talk about the generations and the license types. OK, so on to uh, our new operating system support policy. Why did we make this change, first of all? Um, well, up until two months ago, we were still testing and releasing and supporting on 10.10 .10 Yosemite. And I know that there are pockets of Yosemite out there, but Office 2016, towards kind of the, you know, the last few months, became a worse product because we had to keep supporting 10.10. .10. You, you know, there are ways of if def in the code to say, you know, if I'm on this version of the OS, do that. But it got so squirrely that there were just some features in Office 2016 that just we, we, we had to distill it down to such old APIs that you, know, you have your fancy new machine, you have 10.13, but the kind of rendering quality was so poor because we had to keep that 10.10 .10 supported. And so we kind of wanted to, to kind of move away from the old. And so we said, well, we could say that 10.12 is the minimum, right? And you know, logically, 10.12 is n minus 2. But 10.12 is not the minimum. n minus 2 is the minimum because right now, n minus 2 support is Mojave as n, High Sierra, n minus 1, and then Sierra as n minus 2. Now, you know, assuming Apple keeps to its standard rhythm, what will happen? in September or fall of next year is our n minus 2 will kick in again, and our support will move on. So you know, I, you, can't, you can't imagine how, how I wanted to write 10.15 up there. You know, <laughs> and you knew that I wanted to write 10.15, but of course I couldn't. But assuming that Apple sticks to its standard rhythm, I We'll, we'll probably see you know, a new major version of Mac OS next year. And assuming that's, been, that's the case, and it, they stated that rhythm, then uh, in fall, we will then move our minimum system requirement up one notch. So we'll support that new version, 10.14, and then 10.13. And that, that will be a hard switch. You know, at that point, you know, we will kind of cut it off. And if you're still running 10.12, you will just stay where you are and kind of not, not advance until you upgrade your OS. But through this mechanism, we get to deliver you the best quality office. And you know, through our telemetry, it really shows that you're really good about moving forward uh, when new versions of the OS come along. So, um, so this policy uh, is for the big five, uh, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, OneNote uh, in the suite. And uh, also uh, Microsoft Auto Update, or MAU, as it's known affectionately, uh, that will stay supporting 10.10. .10. So there's just one version of MAU uh, that covers all the versions. Let me tell you a little bit about the differences in engineering. Uh, we, when we released 2011 for Mac, we, uh, we took 10% of the team, and we put them on our essentially our sustaining uh, releases. That 10% would kind of listen for feedback, look at user forums. They would come out with like minor releases, service pack releases. The rest of the 90% of the team would be driving bulldozers through the code, ripping out carbon APIs and replacing with Cocoa and, you know, moving things to sandboxing and moving things onward to 64-bit. So that 90% of our team would be dark for a long period of time. And then, you know, boom, we get uh, you know, a brand new version of, of Office for Mac. So that's why you, know, you kind of look at the UI differences between 2011 and 2016, and they are stark. Now, that didn't happen after the 2016 release. Instead, we took. 100% of our team, and we worked iteratively every month building and improving the existing version of Office. There was no distinction between sustaining and new construction. And so when we came out with you know, Office 2019, we, we launched this at Ignite about a month ago. You know, the, it, it was kind of great shipping it, but uh, it was also a little weird because People would say, well, I'm, I'm running Office 2016. I just upgraded to 2019, and uh, there's no difference. 
Like, you know, where, where's the fancy new dark mode UI? You know, where, where are all the new features? And, and that's because we've been continually delivering new features, you know, during, during that last three years. So uh, there was, uh, Jeff and I did a fireside chat yesterday, and somebody asked the question, well, well is, is Office 2019 going to be stable? Is it still buggy? Should I wait a while? And, it, and, the, and the answer is no, because really Office 2019 is just Office 2016, but with all of the feature gates taken out so that you can see all the features. The code is exactly the same. OK? Um, how do we kind of decide what features we show? Um, so in fall of 2015, we re when we released the initial build of Office 2016, um, we had a base set of features. And the base set of features were available to those running a perpetual license, which is like volume license or retail. Um, and they were available to Office 365 subscribers. But as time moved on, as the months moved on, we had bug fixes, security updates on the perpetual side, and we introduced new features on the subscription side. You know, the thing that perhaps is not really clear is that the build that you get, the package you download, the update that you get is exactly the same, regardless of what license you're on, regardless of how you're activated, regardless, regardless of which language you're in. It is a, a, the identical build. And at runtime, when you launch Outlook, when you launch Word, it's at that point do we look at the license and say, oh, you're a volume license user. OK, we'll show this to you. Right? It's uh, I kind of uh, I liken it to you know like my cable subscription. My uh, my eldest daughter you know would be like in her room with parental control set, and she has you know just access to 20 channels through the through the TV. And then she turns 18, and remove, I remove the parental controls, and then overnight Comcast delivered an extra 300 channels to her. And it, it wasn't that great of Comcast, right? But, but of course, those channels were already there. They were there for years. It's just that she couldn't see them. And it's very much like the difference between perpetual and subscription. Those features were already there if you were running a perpetual build. They, they, they just were turned off, OK? So I kind of want to give you some confidence that although 2019 is a kind of a new release for us, it's a new generation, but it's, it's absolutely just increments of the, uh, of the old one. So uh, it kind of it, it, there comes a question. So when we have this new 2019 release, is it all of the features that you've had in 365 or a subset? Well, when we build features, they're tagged as either client-side code or service-backed code. And sometimes it's a little difficult to, to tell the difference between these, but like the, uh, the, the focus mode in Word, that code, that feature, is purely client-driven. There is no communication to any back-end service that, that, that powers that. So that's on the client side. Um, but there are some other features, like insert picture, insert icon, um, some like collaboration, online sharing that is service-backed. We, we have to have a, a, you know, a cloud service at the back end powering it. So you have a list of client-backed features and a list of service-backed features. Our general principle for how we decide what goes into a new perpetual release, like a new version of the volume license, is that we take all the client features and a couple of service features, and that's really the difference. So what you see here on that one slide is the difference between uh, kind of what you would have on Office 365 and then you know, the new features that you would get if you upgraded from Office 2016 to Office 2019. OK, so hopefully that kind of gives you a, a little bit of background as to how we do things and why we do things. And uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, throw it over to Jeff. Awesome. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I am super excited to be talking about Outlook, specifically admin capabilities in Outlook. So usually I talk about a lot of features, like the features you saw in the last slide, the, the, the yellow ones in Outlook, which is a shout out to Outlook 2011. Uh, now that we're blue. Uh, but this time I'm here to talk about new things we're doing to, uh, to provide admins the ability to manage Outlook and configure Outlook. And 
This is really based on all the feedback we've gotten from you in the audience. This is, this is new capabilities where we've said, we need a better end user experience. We need to you know, help deploy Office and Outlook, set up accounts, and manage the in-app settings for end users. So I'm excited to, to go through a bunch of uh, uh, new preferences, pref keys that are added that you can use uh, in configuration profiles to manage Outlook. So this is kind of a new demo for me, but I'm going to go through how you can set these keys, what they are, and when they're available. And the cool thing is many of these things just shipped last week uh, in our October release. All right, let's get into it. It's just, this is just going to be a, a flow of preferences here. Um, wanted to start in the area of account setup. So uh, by far, the largest request we've had over the past few years is I want end users to be able to launch Outlook for the first time and see their account get added and start syncing right away. No prompts, no, like, what email address do I need to put into Outlook? Just have it add. And so what we did was, this was kind of an iterative process where we leveraged a new pref key that was added a few months ago in 16.13, uh, Office Auto Sign-In. This is in the Office uh, Preferences domain to kind of suppress uh, dialogues on first run, to try to improve that first run experience for activation. We extended this to also grab that activation email address and add it in Outlook. So we'll just jump into a few demo videos I have right here. And what you'll also notice is these are in dark mode. Had to have a little extra sizzle here. <laughs> and uh, so uh, hopefully you don't get distracted. There's going to be so many cool things happening. <laughs> All right. So uh, I start here with, let's see. I start here with the, uh, it already disappeared, the config profile that had Office Auto sign-in set to true, and also that uh, a demo Office 365 account added. So I minimize the config profile. This is, uh, consider this a brand new uh, install of Office for Mac. You have Outlook that's never been launched before. It's not in an activated state. And because of those two pref keys set, now uh, on first launch, we're going to get prompted to activate with that uh, account that we had in. So I'll, I'll just stop it there. It was that Henrietta uh, uh, Office 365 demo account that I had. So I put in the password. I'll unpause. And we'll start activating Outlook. So this is something similar that would happen in any Office app. But now immediately we jump into Outlook, and we're adding the same account as your Office 365 mailbox. It starts adding right away, connects, Start syncing, all your emails there. Smooth as butter. So the only thing you had to enter was the password. There were no other dialogues that you had to click on. No other uh, dialogues. The end user has all the email there waiting. All right, so that was pretty straightforward. The, one of the first reactions I've received to that is, in our environment, we don't have the same email address for our mailbox as the office activation email address. Maybe it's just a difference like a .biz for activation and a .com, or it could be a complete different email address like a first name .last name instead of an alias. So we added a new pref key just in the Outlook domain, now shipped as of last week, that you can designate the default uh, email address or domain. So the syntax there is you can have a full email address or just a domain like contoso.com. And so uh, we'll jump into the, uh, the next demo. A little bit different. Uh, you'll see, I won't start it yet, the, the same config profile with um, the Office preferences set, that Office auto sign-in and the activation email address. Uh, but when I get this started, I'll also switch down to uh, what I have is a, in the Outlook preferences domain, an email address to be added in Outlook. And this is not just any email address. This is my email address. I am showing this. You could probably determine what my email address is from my Slack handle. But there it is. What will happen now on first launch is that we'll add my corporate email address in Outlook instead of that office activation email address. So we launch uh, Outlook. We get the prompt to activate Office with that test demo account for 365. And then Outlook launches, and I'm prompted for my corp account. So since we don't have the creds in the keychain, I do have to authenticate. 
And at Microsoft, we have two-step auth set up, so I put my password in. I get prompted uh, for my phone off. And you'll also notice I actually have Company Portal installed. I, I'm in a, a group where my device is enrolled. I can't add my account in Outlook unless my device is enrolled and meeting uh, the uh, requirements uh, for my Mac, such as password, things like that. So once all of that has gone through, again, the end user just had to password and two-step auth. Everything continues just as you saw before. And we get the account added. My account is a little bit bigger than that demo account, but this is all my folders, and lots and lots of items in my inbox will start appearing. And uh, yes, you're looking at my email on screen right now. So uh, that's an example where the email address being added in Outlook doesn't match the Office activation email. All right, so on the same kind of uh, side for account setup, uh, instead of adding accounts, we also had some requests about preventing accounts being added, specifically personal accounts. So this is something, you know, uh, there's lots of different companies and organizations out there that don't want personal accounts side by side with their corporate accounts. And uh, again, when we developed Outlook, we wanted it all in. Put everything in there, have all your accounts together, your calendars together. We realized that this is not the case for every organization. This is what we hear in Mac admins. And so what we did was we decided to be really geeky with this one. We wanted to give admins as much flexibility as possible. And instead of just saying, like, a Boolean pref, you know, don't allow Gmail or Outlook.com or iCloud, we have a whitelist where you can designate the domains to be added via an array of regular expressions. So once that's set, the end user will try to add, and they won't uh, um, be able to uh, add their personal account. On the end of that, after the account uh, you know, is added, say you do have a corporate account, we always had this text that says, you know, did you know you can add these personal accounts in Outlook? I mentioned that's something we used to want you to do. We still want you to do if, if you're allowed to. But uh, we also realized that this might imply you know, that your organization supports this. If there's a problem with your iCloud account in Outlook, that your IT department has to support it. So not only did we introduce the ability to uh, prevent adding the accounts, but if you need to also suppress this text, you can do that as well. So now we'll take a look at both of this together. All right. So here's. Uh, the config profile with those two preferences set. You'll notice I put in this example Microsoft.org, uh, uh, com, or biz. This is just an example, but using regular expressions, I could designate that. If you have .co.uk or anything else, you have that flexibility now. And we'll be providing documentation on how to use this. In fact, we actually have some uh, admin documentation just published to docs.microsoft.com that I can uh, reference. So essentially, with these set, a user can go into Outlook, and they can add their uh, personal account, whether it's Gmail, iCloud, um, or Outlook.com. Now, Jeff at Outlook.com is not me, so don't send emails there. But if I try to add my uh, corp account again, it proceeds to add. And as I mentioned with the other pref key set, not only does it add, but I don't get the uh, did you know in my face where I just got it blocked. Don't tell me that I can add it. So we have that removed as well. OK. So those were all around kind of account configuration and kind of setup. Uh, the other area where we're making changes based on the feedback from the admin community and all the customers we've been talking to recently is being able to manage in-app settings within Outlook. And this is something, you know, we have some preferences out there documented, but in the past, you haven't been able to set that preference as forced, and meaning in the UI, it's disabled. And this is a common example here with the automatic download of images uh, from the internet, where you could actually set it to never, but an end user could just change it. And then on relaunch, it would go back to never, and it would confuse users. So now we are using the correct API to disable it in code, and we have a bunch of preferences, you know, in Outlook preferences that can now be managed. 
So we're really excited about this. We want to get feedback from uh, admins on you know, what, they're, what they're managing in Outlook and how the end user experience is. We also added a bunch of new preferences that weren't in Outlook before. So uh, talking to customers, especially around the area of data leakage I mentioned, uh, managing you know, and adhering to uh, company policies around data, uh, importing and exporting of archive files. So you can import a PST or an OLM into Outlook for Mac. You can export an OLM. These are things now you can prevent end users from doing. If you don't want them bringing in old PSTs uh, or pulling data out of Outlook. Uh, you can do this, and now with using the correct APIs, we can actually disable uh, the entry points in Outlook. Did the same thing for signatures. This is a little bit different. We talked to a few customers who said, we use a server-side solution for signatures. It stamps a fancy signature on the way out. In Windows Outlook, we have it disabled, so users don't do a client signature. But we have some users in Outlook for Mac who put their signature in, and then when they send, they have two signatures. And so this seems like maybe something a little bit uh, you know, superficial, but it actually is very important to these organizations who have these you know, really uh, uh, handcrafted signatures via the server-side solution. So here we disable the entry points to prevent users from creating signatures and setting them as a default for uh, their um, account. Next one is, an, uh, is a fun one because it's a little bit silly. By default, when we uh, launch Outlook for Mac, you go into the calendar, you might see the weather in calendar. It's actually one of those kind of delighters. A lot of users have said they like having a sneak peek of what their weather is. It kind of makes you feel you know, uh, local to your, uh, your current location. By default, if we don't know where you are, we go to Washington, D.C. You may have seen this. And we actually had a lot of requests from users uh, around the globe where, due to the way their configuration is set up, it was defaulting to Washington, D.C. And at first, I would say, OK, you can set it. You go into Choose Location and change it. And of course, I get returned, Jeff, it's 2018. Like, let's just set this as a pref key. On launch, you can determine, uh, uh, by preference, the location. And below it, you'll see update uh, location automatically. We've talked to customers that say they have location services disabled. They don't want end users uh, changing this. So with our new uh, you know, managed preferences uh, capabilities, you can now actually disable that as a choice. And last but not least, this is brand new. This just got checked in, is around online meetings. So we talked to a lot of users that uh, use Skype or Teams now for chat but not for online meetings. You might use WebEx or something else, and this causes a lot of pain. End users are uh, selecting online meeting details when they're creating an event, and it's causing confusion because maybe they should be using WebEx or Skype, and how do I join? And uh, the solution here is you know, just to disable that entry point. Um, and I have in this screenshot Skype and Teams side by side. That's just showing both. Uh, we're actually in the process of releasing Teams meeting integration into Insider Fast right now. And uh, uh, for you guys to try that out, eventually we'll be you know, providing the same capabilities for both Skype and Teams. All right, so let's uh, show all of this together. I have a config profile with all of these uh, preferences I just mentioned. Another popular one within the Outlook preferences is, is hide my, on my computer folders. I talked about you know, exporting local data. A lot of people drag items from their server folders to on my computer folders. Now you can actually uh, set that preference to hide and force it to disable it. So let's take a look, all of this in action. All right, so we go to Outlook preferences uh, into the general. You can see that hide on my computer folders is uh, selected and disabled. Into reading preferences, there's the, what I showed before, automatic download of pictures from the internet is set to never. Users can't change it. Over to signatures, I talked a little bit about disabling the, online, uh, the, the ability to create a client-side signature if you're using a server-side signature. And what that also means is when you're composing a message, that that entry point is disabled in the ribbon and in the top menu. And lastly, going over to the calendar view, there's uh, uh, Minneapolis as my default location. 
I did this from Sunnyvale, and I had uh, location services disabled, and also there's Skype and Teams meeting uh, entry points disabled in uh, uh, the ribbon and also in the top menu. So lots of new stuff. And, and really, I want to say we really couldn't have done this without you. This is all based on your feedback. And this is a new thing for really for the Outlook team and uh, for the Outlook for Mac as a product. This is my first JNUC. Uh, you know, we're here to listen to your feedback, and we want to hear about how these first set of capabilities, you know, work for you and what else you need. So there's nothing I like more to hear than I'm using, you know, um, Office Auto Sign-In, but I need these three more things. We want to hear it from you guys. And so it really has been a great being part of the community, as uh, Paul said, for about three years, and uh, listening to all the feedback and really making Outlook uh, you know, more of an enterprise-ready and enterprise-manageable uh, app. So I got through it. I think we got a few minutes for Q&A. <laughs> and, all right, thank you. If you've, if you've got questions, please just come up to the two mics here so everyone can hear. Thanks. Very good. <clears throat> First, thank you for that uh, auto-signing feature. Very needed one. Thank you for that. So You're two welcome. questions. First question is, uh, on a Windows side, we can play with a document retention policy, which means how long you can keep email before it's automatically deleted. Is that going to come for macOS side? Automatic? Yeah, so uh, the uh, retention policy is viewing and setting the actual retention tag. Mm -hmm. It's not available in Outlook for Mac right now. You have to go to Windows Outlook or the web. It's something that we're planning to do. Uh, I, I've mentioned in our fireside chat, it's one of the things, one of several things that we don't get because we use EWS to sync with uh, Exchange and Office 365. So we're in the process of a, a major um, re-architecture of Outlook. Yeah. As Paul kind of demonstrated, we're doing this stuff uh, now as we continue to ship monthly. We're actually doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes. It's disabled, it's dark. And when we're ready to introduce it, we'll announce it, just like we did with REST Calendar. So uh, it's, it's going to be a while, but it's certainly something we hear a lot about. I guess you end up answering my second question, which okay. is, uh, since uh, macOS is using EWS and uh, Windows is using MAPI, what is being left behind on the Mac side? But, yeah, uh, I know. It's, I mean, a lot of the times, the types of uh, presentations I give, if you've been to Microsoft Ignite Conference, is about Windows parity. And so, you know, we're, our goal now is to bring the features that users are asking, and that could be an end user feature or that could be what admins want. We're bringing it into Outlook for Mac based on priority. We're not going to get everything from Windows Outlook. Uh, and I always hear the feature. I do want to hear the feature requests because we did add read receipts. We did add send later. We are adding these features. It's just, it's going to be one by one, and we're not going to get everything from Windows Outlook. So great question. Hi, thank you for doing this. Um, I have a question kind of regarding what you just mentioned about parity. We've had some executives denying managers the ability to buy Macs because they're afraid of Excel not being on par with the, uh, the Mac Excel not being on par with the Windows Excel. Can you guys comment on that? Are they pretty close? Not too bad? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, Jeff, you want to take an Excel question? Uh, go for it, Paul. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> for the, um, it's kind of interesting, the, the, the way that we architect the Mac apps. Um, so you, you would have noticed uh, back in January of this year, we flipped the major version from 15 to 16. And uh, yeah, when we moved from the 2016 to 2019 generation client, we didn't change any versions at all. But that, that's kind of a, a side point. But what we build now in terms of the apps, the core apps like Excel, that is the exact same C and C++ code as what's running on Windows. The calc engine that performs all your kind of recalc on Excel for Windows is identical. It is actually the same code that runs on Excel uh, on the Mac. But that only happened as of January. 
when we flipped to version 16 and we uh, converged all of our code for all platforms into a single code base. Um, we got a whole bunch of things for free as part of converging. You know, one of the big things was uh, multi threaded uh, recalc. Um, for, for years, we, you know, we've just been calculating on a single core. Uh, and, uh, and now we, now we have that um, amazing performance. There are, there are still some features that um, uh, are kind of uh, missing from Outlook for Mac, uh, sorry, for Excel for Mac, uh, around external data access. There are some catch up that we need to do there. Um, a few people have asked about Power BI support as well and Power BI native apps. And, and that's something that uh, we hadn't originally planned, but uh, we've, we've taken the feedback and We'll try and get that one on the list there. But in terms of core performance um, and functionality uh, on the local machine without data, external data access, I would say that we are at parity across those platforms now. And to clarify, uh, that move to 16, you know, Outlook for Mac did come along with that, but we do not share code with Windows Outlook. So with a lot of stuff for free with Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, a lot of the great features we've seen now this year uh, because of that convergence, I got a lot of questions like, oh, yeah, now we have quick steps in Outlook for Mac. Uh, not so fast. As I mentioned, one by one, we're picking off uh, uh, features as uh, they're requested and, and prioritized. So um, the move to version 16 wasn't like the, all uh, the silver bullets for, for Outlook. Hey, guys. Um, I was just wondering, is there a preferred approach for the installation of Office? Uh, I've been using the PKG, but Bill also showed me, I believe, um, a script that automatically gets the latest version, kind of like the Acrobat script. Um, is, would you have one over the other? Is this for installing the, the Office, Office package? Yeah. Um, the, uh, ultimately, all of our portals and funnels, they they distill down into a set of forward links. Um, if you look at the Mac admins page, they go to the, like, the same forward links. And, you know, I, can, I can look you in the eye here and say, you can go to forward link 525133, and that will always give you the latest version of, of Office for Mac. And he knows every single forward link. <laughs> in relation to Jamf, um, will that work the same way for patching? Uh, yeah, you can use, um, uh, so, so we have a, a notion of installers and updaters. Installers uh, contain the core application. They contain the licensing daemon, uh, which is used for perpetual licensing, and also MAU for auto-update. We also have updater packages, which are solely for updating a single app. They don't include that kind of periphery support. However, what I do see is a lot of people, they just, keep deploying the installer, the suite installer, and what you can push that out to a machine that doesn't have Office or a machine that has a really old version of Office or a machine that has last month's version of Office. And the great thing is you get that same result. So there's no problem with using an installer. We use some um, optimizations within packaging where the, uh, we uh, have a shared copy of fonts, frameworks, and proofing tools. So we cut down on the kind of the size of the installer. But uh, any time that you see uh, you know, a forward link, it's like go.microsoft.com slash fwlink, that is an official place um, that, that you can get Office from. Cool. Thank you. Hello. I have a bunch of questions. Uh, the MAU feature, at one point you had it as uh, an admin feature, where you had to be an admin to be able to download and run MAU. You changed that with the version of 16, I think 16, 14. Uh, will that remain as a, you can be a non-admin and still run MAU and get your updates, or will that change? Yeah, so a uh, good question. Um, it was actually MAU 3.8.2 that we made that change. Uh, it was kind of quite some time ago. Um, what we used to do is, you know, download packages through MAU, and then we would uh, kick the installer, uh, essentially command line. But uh, when you do that, you, you need to elevate your privileges. Um, as of 3.8.2, um, we install a privileged helper 
so now we download the package, we hand it off to the root process. Mm -hmm. The root makes sure that the uh, package that we downloaded has the correct SHA-256 hash, uh, is signed by Microsoft, and then it hands it off to the privileged helper tool, which then performs the actual yeah. install. So uh, it's completely admin-less. You don't have to type in any admin creds for uh, updating Mao itself or any of the, uh, the Office applications. Okay. Um, yep, that's the core feature. OK. A and going from 16 to 19, will MAU on 16 prompt you to update to 19, or is it a special? Uh, that's a great question. So um, version 16.16.x uh, 16 .16 is the Office 2016 generation. So with Office 16.17, that is the start of the Office 2019 generation. If you're activated with an Office 365 subscription, mm -hmm. Mao will, will, will simply look at your existing configuration and get you to the very latest that you're entitled to. So if you have a 365 subscription, with and you meet at least uh, the n minus two requirement, Mail will get you to the latest. If you don't meet those requirements, Mail will offer you the latest based on that license type or OS version. So you you will have to run a 1619 special upgrade to get you from. If if you're running let's say volume license yep, with license. Office 2016, yep. you will need to uh, run the VL serializer mm -hmm. for 2019, and at the same time, you would install the latest build of Office 2019, which right now is 16.18. Okay, so, so and the serializer will be different for 19. The serializer 16. has a different key. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, one note. So when, when you bundled in one note inside of Office 2011 and 2016, that's the cloud sign-on. Is that, and so, in, so once you run the serializer, you could get the on-prem, all the other Office apps, but one node remained to be just a cloud sign-on. Is that the case with 19? Yes, it is, yeah. And in fact, Any that, that has also changed on the Windows side as well, where um, one note requires a, a, a cloud sign-in. Okay, thank yep. you. Just have time for one more, but I think you guys are able to stick around to chat with everyone else. Yeah. Sorry, yes. just hitting time here. But so he answered my question about the uh, serializer, but uh, as far as the features go, with the Windows side, I have an HR department to like to send to groups and reply from somewhere else. The Mac doesn't do that currently. Will 2019? Will that be in one of the features in 2019 to send ads and reply ads to someone else? Yeah, so that's, that's not a good question. It's not a feature that we've you know, added in 2019. You, you saw on uh, Paul's slide, there was a bunch of things that were in 365 already that we rolled up into 2019. So send later, read receipts, focused inbox, app mentions, a bunch of things, but not send as. So that's something that's on our list that, uh, that we want to do in the future. Uh, but good to hear that that's a, uh, your feature request. Okay. All right. With that, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you, guys. <laughs>